How did Imam Muslim die? There's an interesting story as to what actually happened. What actually happened. In terms of an introduction to Imam Muslim, what's important to know about Imam Muslim is that after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after Sahih al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim is the one that authored the, I guess, the, the second most authentic book after you know, Sahih al-Bukhari and after the Qur'an. Right after Sahih al-Bukhari and the Qur'an, Imam Muslim had the second most authentic book. And this is a great privilege and an honor for any Muslim to have. That you know, when we talk about authentic narrations uh, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Imam Bukhari's name is there, and just along with Imam al-Bukhari is the name of Imam Muslim, is the name of Imam Muslim. Something interesting that is mentioned about Imam Muslim that isn't mentioned about Imam al-Bukhari, was his physical description. So with Imam al-Bukhari, there's not much talk about his physical description. Whereas when it came to Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, there is actually quite a bit of talk about his physical description. So in terms of the profession of Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, Imam Muslim used to be a, a tradesman by profession. So he obviously his primary focus was on hadith, but the way that he sustained himself was that he used to sell small items of food. So things like nuts, so things like dates. These are the things that Imam Muslim used to sell, things like honey. Imam Muslim, these are the things that Imam Muslim would sell. And you know, this is how he would make his money and survive to continue teaching his hadith. And he was actually disparged, meaning that you know, a lot of people, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Disparged, put him down. They put Imam Muslim down, because one of the places that he would teach his hadith is in a place of business. So if someone wanted to come and seek hadith while he was doing business, Imam Muslim wouldn't have a problem teaching them. Whereas amongst the early scholars of hadith, this was a big no-no. That if you wanted to teach the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, it had to be in a very noble place, like the masjid or in a school. You would not teach the hadith of the Prophet wasallam in any place. And this is something interesting that if you look at you know, the type of honor and respect that the scholars of the past paid to hadith, it's completely different to our understanding of it in our times. Just to give you two examples from the scholars of the past, one with Imam, Muslim, uh, one with Imam Malik rahimahullah. <clears throat> so Imam Malik rahimahullah, he was born in 93, died in 179. Not only was he a scholar of fiqh, but he was also a scholar of hadith. And Imam Malik rahimahullah, when he would go and teach hadith, he would in fact dress up in his nicest clothes, put on his breast fragrance. He's like, if I can do this when I'm going to a party, why can't I do this when I'm teaching the noble words of Allah's Messenger So he would dress up in his nicest clothes to go and teach the hadith of the Prophet Not only that, there's a very interesting story on how Imam Malik rahimahullah was one day teaching hadith, and in the masjid of the Prophet wasallam, a scorpion came and bit him. Not once, not twice, not three times, but close to 30 times and a bit more. 30 times and a bit more. And Imam Malik, as he's narrating the hadith, he didn't want to interrupt his class of hadith. So he let the scorpion keep biting him, let the scorpion keep biting him. And when the class finished, they noticed that Imam Malik is getting up and he's limping and he's cringing like this. So the students asked him, Ya Imam, you know, are you okay? What's wrong? And then Imam Malik, like, he's like, I don't think I can walk. And he like literally collapsed at his knees at that time. They uncovered his shirt, and that's when they found the 30 scorpion bites at that time. Now you would think this is very, very far-fetched. Like, you know, a Muslim is not required to do this. And this is the very point. That as a Muslim, we're not required to show this level of respect and this level of honor to Islam and to the Qur'an and to the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. But what will distinguish a muttaqi and a muhsin from just the average Muslim is the amount of love, of love and respect and honor that he shows to you know the, the major uh, shrines of Islam, right? That yeah, that you know whoever magnifies and glorifies the shrines of Islam, then that is indeed from the taqwa of the hearts. That is from the taqwa of the hearts. Now, Imam, getting back to Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, this is one of the things that he was criticized for. And in the narration of Al Hakim, who was a great scholar of Hadith that came after him. He then mentions this a bit about, about Imam Muslim rahimahullah. And in this, this is where he talks about the description of Imam Muslim. He talks about the description of Imam Muslim rahimahullah. And he mentions four things about him. Four things about him. Number one, is that Imam Muslim's back was very, very straight. That he always kept his chest out and his back straight and firm. And this is like, you know, a sign of confidence. This is a, a sign of, of, you know, good posture and, you know, like good health and strength as well. That this is the first thing that you'd notice about Imam Muslim, that he always kept his back straight and he always kept, you know, a, a position of, of being tall. A position of being tall. The second thing that they mention about Imam Muslim 
is that he had white hair. So from like a very, a very young age, he gathered, he started to have white hair. And you know, in our day and age, you know, white hair is like considered like this big disease. You know, as you turn 20 years old, you start having white hair, you start panicking, you're like, I'm getting old, I need to dye my hair. But in reality, from an Islamic perspective, white hair is considered like a, a side of honor and a side of pride. You know, white hair is like considered a sign of wisdom. There are a lot of hadith that are mentioned about the virtues of white hair, but the vast majority of them are weak. The vast majority of them are weak. But it's a sign of nobility, it is a sign of, of respect. That the Prophet wasallam. When you study the Shama'il Muhammadiyah, this is what you notice about the Prophet ﷺ as well. That from, you know, a quite, not a super young age, like in his 20s, but in his 40s, like as soon as revelation started to come down, his hair started to whiten very, very early. And he started from the side of his jawline, went into his beard, then went to the back of his head. And what's interesting is, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he's counting the hair of the Prophet ﷺ as this is happening. The number of white hair. And this shows us you know, the level uh, of diligence and how meticulous they were in preserving the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, particularly his physical appearance as well, particularly his physical appearance as well. The third characteristic he mentions about Imam Muslim is that Imam Muslim rahimahullah, he had a tall, uh, a long fluffy white beard, a long fluffy white beard. So now when you think of white hair, you think of long fluffy white beard, you know who do you think of in our culture? You think of someone like Santa Claus, right? But Imam Muslim rahimahullah, with his long fluffy white beard, this was something that again was a sign of honor and pride for him. That regularly in his hadith class, you see him stroking his beard, right? Regularly stroking his beard. When he's busy thinking, he's stroking his beard. And this is like a, a sign of pride and honor for him. And then the third thing, that, the fourth and last thing that is mentioned about Imam Muslim in terms of his physical description, is that Imam Muslim rahimahullah was always seen wearing a turban. Was always seen wearing a turban. And it was a type of turban that had a long tail at the end, that would hang between his two shoulders, that would hang between his two shoulders. What's interesting is Imam al-Tirmidhi in his Shama'il al-Muhammadiyah, meaning the physical description of the Prophet wasallam. this is what he narrates about the Prophet wasallam. that when the Messenger of Allah wasallam used to wear his turban, he would let the tail hang and hang between his shoulders. So that when he would be walking, you would see the tail of the turban, you know, hanging behind him. And what they would use the tail of the turban for, is that when they would get onto a horse, and sand is coming their way, or there's something that you know, they need to protect their face from, they would take the tail of the turban, and use it to cover their face, and use it to cover their face. Now this leads us into a small discussion. What is the ruling on covering your head? What is the ruling on covering your head? And I don't know if I've told you my, my funny story about when I visited Pakistan. Did I tell you guys this story? I'll, I'll tell, it, tell it again, just because of how funny of a story it is. <clears throat> So I was uh, about 13, 14 years old last, uh, when I went to visit Pakistan. This is like the last time I went. This is like in 1997, subhanAllah. At this young age, I go to the masjid, and I've learned like very basics of the deen, and you know, my prayer has already started to change to a certain degree. <laughs> Meaning I'm no longer praying like your, your, your typical Hanafi, which is like the predominant madhab. So saying Amin out loud, doing, you know, raising of the hands in the masjid, these are big taboo subjects in the masjid. And they're very strict on this. Now, one of the things that I wasn't doing out of like a change in my fiqh, but just because out of like sheer ignorance, was that I didn't cover my head. You know, I didn't cover my hair. At the age of 13, 14, if I'm covering my head, it's like I'm wearing like a baseball cap. Right? I had like this Montreal Expos and you know, Montreal Canadiens baseball cap. That's what I would always wear. In Pakistan, you couldn't really pull that off. They're like, where did this weirdo come from? You know, why is he wearing these clothes? So go to the masjid, my head is completely uncovered, and I'm praying Tahiyyat al-Masjid. Okay? While I'm praying Tahiyyat al-Masjid, they have this box in the back of the masjid where they keep the caps. They're like, you know, head caps, they keep these caps over there. And people like donated them to the masjid, they're never washed, never cleaned, like foul, foul, foul stuff, man. Like who knows what's happened with these caps, subhanAllah. So while I'm praying, this man, with the purest of intentions, like he's like one of the nicest people you'll ever meet, subhanAllah. He grabs a hat from the back, and while I'm in salah, he puts it on my head. He notices, mashallah, I have a very big head. The hat doesn't fit. He, <laughs> he goes and he grabs another hat. And in salah, he's like, you know, let's try to get this one to stick. It's not working. And in salah, I'm like, what is this guy doing? You know, why won't he just leave me alone? I'm going down into Rukua, the man's standing there waiting for me to get up to put a hat on my head. I rush down into Sajda so that he can't reach me. Where am I going to get stuck? Where am I going to get stuck? Is when I'm doing Tashahud, right? I can't move. It's like I'm his hostage at that time. 
So the Shabbat time comes, he, at this time he's tried like two or three different hats, it's not working. What does he do? He pulls a handkerchief out of his pocket, he's from Mishnah Kameez. And it was like the most foulest thing I've ever seen Salah. Like he must, well, may Allah have mercy on him, he must have like blown his nose, wiped his sweat off, you know, it's like brown in color, and it's like original shade is yellow, and it's just foul. And he's tying it on my head while I'm in this out. And I'm like, Ya Allah, you know, what is going on? So that was like my, 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 my story in Pakistan of like, you know, head coverings. I learned from that after that, bring your own hat or you will be tortured. <laughs> you know, learn from my mistake. And from then on, you know, I always covered my head in the masjid. Now the actual ruling on, on covering the head. A lot of people think that, you know what, it was, the Prophet ﷺ was very, very rarely seen, uh, you know, leaving his house with an uncovered head. In fact, very, very few instances are actually narrated that the Prophet ﷺ left with his head uncovered. And the instances that are mentioned, they talk about how, how his hair was parted in the middle, how the hair of the uh, Messenger of Allah was oily and was shiny. And this is what is mentioned. But the vast majority of times, the head of the Prophet ﷺ is actually covered. And it's covered with a, you know, um, a cloth hat that they used to call a kalanswa. A kalanswa. And they used a kalanswa, a cloth hat, to fit under a turban so that the turban would not slide off. So you put this on under a turban and it will keep the turban in place, it will keep the turban steady. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ was seen the vast majority of times. Now the scholars of fiqh actually discussed